warm welcome to those that are behind the camera out there or on the phone lines and certainly is great to be joined together on God's Sabbath day. So brethren, it is time to begin services, so I'll ask Mr. Eric Lee to come forward and open services with prayer. So everyone please stand, Mr. Lee. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for bringing us all together on this gorgeous Sabbath day. And thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to know you and your plan. And thank you for this calling that you've given us. And Father, please help us not to take this calling lightly and help us to draw closer to you. And Father, we ask as we come together now to, for you to place your presence here to inspire the speaking, inspire our hearing. And Father, please just be with all your people around the world on this Sabbath day. And we turn this over into your hands and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brethren, it is time to uh, sing some songs, so if you'll all open up your hymnals, we'll begin with page number 50 in the older hymnal, that's page number 76 in the newer hymnal, 50 in the old, 76 in the new, God is my rock, my salvation. great beginning for our second hymn if you'll turn over to page number 103 in the older hymnals that's page number 149 in the new 103 in the old 149 in the new by the waters of babylon
our third hymn. If you'll turn with me over to page number 45. Page number 45. That's number 72 in the newer hymnals, 45 in the old, 72 in the new. But as for me, I'll call on God. Thank you, brethren. If you'll all please take your seats. Now for the main message today, Mr. Steve Buchanan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great for everybody to be here. It's good to see all of you. Uh, for those of you who are listening in, we've got... Uh, one lady we haven't had here for a long time. It's great to have her back. I'll talk about her later, but uh, great to have her here. To begin with, I'd like to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. I think we're very familiar with the beginning of this chapter, but I want to spend some time and think as I like to do, as, as I remember a long time ago, Mr. Meeker uh, Mr. George Meeker gave a sermon, and he said that if we read slower, that there's a lot of material that's packed into these scriptures, and today I'd like to do that. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. At the beginning of verse 1 here, it says that this is a revelation from God the Father through various individuals that ends up for the purpose in the ears and in the hearing of God's servants. When we think of this particular book, as we're going to read in just a few seconds, this book John wrote to seven churches in Asia. We can look at this particular phrase of his servants and refer to it as literally the seven churches in Asia. But as we understand, this book is prophetic. And God has preserved it all the way to our day and time for all of his servants that have lived from the time that John wrote this all the way to the return of Jesus Christ. 
So the, as we read that this is to be shown to his servants, yes, it includes the physical churches in Asia, but it also includes each and every one of us today and those that have lived in between. And then it follows that after showing to his servants things which must shortly take place. No matter which perspective we'd like to use, if we use the perspective of those who actually lived in one of the seven physical congregations in Asia, this same scripture is still going to have application as far as it, things that will shortly take place. We can look at all of our lives, and we've said this for years, that we are all praying for the return of Jesus Christ but we are not all going to live to the return of Jesus Christ. So today is very important, and the message that's in here is for people who also will not live to the return of Jesus Christ. Things that must shortly take place may involve situations in individuals' lives, no matter when they live, that are important lessons and truths from God that these words help bring out, that these words help encourage us. It goes on when it says that he sent and signified it by his, his angel to his servant John. We understand that John was at this time in exile. And if you read a lot of commentaries, this is what is commonly referred to as the second great persecution on the church. John at this point is in exile for him holding true to the testimony of Jesus Christ and what was given him. He goes on in verse 3. Some very important words. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it once again for the time is near. Blessed is he who reads. This word for reads, the Greek word, is anagenosko. It's really from two different Greek words, A-N-A-H and G-I-N-O-S-K-O. It literally means to know again, or by extension to read or reread. These words are given to read, and they're there for us to study. They're there for us to understand. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear. This Greek word has the meaning, as we commonly know, is to understand or comprehend. It's not to understand or comprehend the ideas of men, it's to understand and comprehend the message that originated from God the Father sent for the purpose to his servants. So we, we can be those who, who hear and understand the words of this prophecy, but then added to that is the responsibility to keep those things which are written in it. And the meaning of this word is to guard, to watch, to preserve. What we are given, again, from God, our responsibility is to keep it, to preserve it, to hold on to it, not to compromise it. Again, for the time is near. And as John's writing this, no doubt, he believes that Christ is coming soon. As all of the apostles in all of the writings that we read start out by saying... Only later in their life, as the Apostle Paul came to understand that he was going to die before the return of Jesus Christ. Again, verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, seven physical congregations, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us, keep this in mind, to him who loved us 
and washed us from our sins in his own blood. In other words, reconciled us to God the Father, atoned for our sins, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. The hope, the goal that is there for all of God's servants to know and understand. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7, something else to keep in mind. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The instruction from God the Father down through various individuals to John who wrote these words under inspiration from God was written to his servants, to all of us. For those physical churches and congregations that re received them, there were direct instructions and warnings and corrections that each needed to heed to. But for those yet in the future, these same instructions and warnings and corrections are meant for us to use in our day. The same instruction for them as us and us applies when it states... Blessed who reads and hears and keeps the words that's in this prophecy and in this book. The added emphasis in these verses to all God's people from that time till now is that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have hope. Encouraging words added to that is the goal of the return of Jesus Christ and all that he brings with him when he returns. This vision and this hope has driven people throughout time, especially as we are focusing on what John is referring to here in this book. But also, along with these familiar words, over time comes very familiar reaction from many of God's people. If you'd like, please turn to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to begin to look at this first letter to the church at Ephesus, but as we do, I want to try to give just a little bit of history and background to the situation and circumstances that this particular congregation faced. Ephesus was in the Roman province of Asia, about 35 miles from Smyrna. It was located opposite the island of Samos. It is the closest of Revelation 7 churches to the island of Patmos, where the Apostle John wrote this book. Ephesus, founded primarily by those from the city of Athens, was the capital of both Ionia and the proconsular Asia. The advantageous loca location of Ephesus made it the chief city of Asia Minor. It maintained an artificial harbor accessible to the largest ships. The city stood at the entrance of a valley that reached far into the province. It was also connected via highways to other important cities in the region. So the ease of traveling to Ephesus, either by land or by sea, made it the most accessible, populated destination in all of Asia. Ephesus had a plethora of the most eminent orators and speakers in the world and contained many beautiful buildings. It was, the world, it was world famous for its large temple to the pagan goddess Diana. The city was also known for building the largest outdoor theater in the world, capable of containing 50,000 spectators at one time. For many years, Ephesus was the largest city in the Roman Empire next to Rome, 
and boasted a population of more than a quarter million people. So a tremendously large and prosperous area. Ephesus housed that at that time some of the, the known world's leaders, entertainers, pagan religions with all of their teachings were prominent, and the wealth from it being so strategically located by both sea or land was prominent. As we think in our day, we think of areas such as New York for us in this country. That by sea or by land, it's accessible. It has many of the leaders that we think of in this world's day and time. So much money, so much finance, so much economy that happens in and around, centered around New York. And we can understand all of the bad that's associated with New York. As we think about the, ch the church here in Ephesus, this is what they're dealing with on a daily basis. As the church and the congregation began to be established in Ephesus, I'm just going to read a few verses to you if you'd like to put it in your notes. It's Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1 through verse 7. As we would expect, the Apostle Paul, with Ephesus being primarily Gentile, there are a few Jews here, but it's primarily Gentile. In Acts 19, verse 1, it said, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Verse 7, now the men were about 12 in all. It appears that this could have been the very beginning of the congregation that we know in Revelation chapter 2 specified as Ephesus. The Apostle Paul making his journey through there. In Acts, we're talking about relatively around 50s A.D. So we're talking about 20 years or so after the Holy Spirit was given in Pentecost 31 A.D. So again, the word traveled much slower than it does today. Letters travel much slower than it does today. And Paul was making his journey and came to Ephesus about this point. John, as he writes in Revelation 2, is writing from the perspective of the 90s A.D. And if you look, there are some that, that think that John could have wrote as late as 96 A.D. But somewhere in the 90s where he's looking at it about 40 years following the giving of the Spirit in 31 A.D. So as, as John is writing in Revelation chapter 2, we have to understand the congregation of Ephesus is established here some 40 years or so after Paul began what we read in Acts chapter 19. So John is writing to a congregation that is older, it's more established, not just perhaps with the truth, but perhaps from all that surrounds them in the world that they live, both in physical lifestyles and religious ideas. So in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So Christ walks amongst all of these churches. He knows everything that's taking place. He knows strengths, weaknesses of every individual. He knows the pressures they face. He knows the situation in and around them. 
I know, verse 2, your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. He begins to give them some things that are their works. They have done. They've shown patient endurance by keeping the truth that God had given, and even here cannot bear those who are evil. They separate themselves from ideas and lifestyles that are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. I never really thought about it a whole lot until this morning as I was studying and reading through this, but the idea of someone coming along and saying they're an apostle was not near as a rarity in their day. They lived in a day where the 12 apostles had lived, had preached, had worked, and John was still there writing and working. In our day and time, for someone to come along and say that he's an apostle, it sticks out because we don't have that today. But in their day, when somebody came along claiming to be an apostle, it's, apostle, it's not that, that sticking out like a sore thumb that it might be for all of us. They had to listen to what they said and proved what they taught to be wrong thus proving them to be false apostles. This is listed amongst the works of Ephesus, the labors, what they had gone through. Verse 3, and you have persevered. If you look up the meaning of that Greek word, it means you have taken up and you have carried over time, you have taken up and carried the responsibility you've been given through whatever it is God has allowed and have patience, which a lot of us understand can refer to patient endurance. You endure through situations that are difficult and hard, but you remain true to what God had given and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. As we think about everything that we have read so far, as far as the description here, I think that we can see that there are similarities between what they experienced and what we have experienced. We have been asked to go through a lot of things. We've been asked to prove teachings of right and wrong and to reject the wrong we have been required to carry what we have been given as a responsibility and to hold true to what god has revealed to us verse four nevertheless i have this against you that you have left your first love all of those labors all of those works and what was their first love is no longer their first love. By what Christ wrote here in the judgment of this church, it doesn't necessarily say everything is in the past tense. Perhaps they still hate those who are evil. They still don't want that. But what was once their first love is no longer their first love. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen. I want you to remember these words. This is not going to be the first time these words have been said. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Three directives from Christ that they need to remember from where they had fallen. They need to repent and to do the first works. All three required to escape the judgment that Christ gives here with the primary emphasis on the last three words, 
of repentance, a true turning from where they are to God, more fully toward God. But this you have, verse 6, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7. So far, this judgment has been to a congregation, to a group of people. But from verse 7 on, it gets individual. He who has an ear. I've got this highlighted. It's very important. He who has an ear, let him, singular, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, as we read this, the individual that reads this is, is stressed that they need to hear what's being said. In other words, it's not a given that everybody that this is intended to truly hears what the Spirit says, where the Spirit guides. We're going to get into that in just a second. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. We've had this emphasized before to us. All of these messages have lessons that each of us need to heed. Goes on to him, singular, who overcomes... This Greek word for overcomes means to conquer, to prevail, or to get the victory. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. These phrases, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and... To him who overcomes, both of those statements appear in every single letter. All of them. It doesn't matter if somebody wants to claim that they are Philadelphian, they still have to overcome. They still have to listen to what the Spirit says and to receive it and apply it as God intends. He who has an ear. I want to focus in on this. Please go to Matthew chapter 13. Many times when we read the parable of the sower, we look at many of these aspects as speaking to the world. And in some of the cases, it's very obvious that it's very easily applicable. But I want to look at all of these categories and think about our own perspective, our individual perspective. Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the gospel of the good news, and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, this is he who receives seed by the wayside. It's so easy for us to become distracted. It's so easy for us to become aloof and not be close to God that sometimes something can be offered and we don't hear it. It flies right past us. We're talking about a heart and a mind in an individual. Verse 20, but he who received the seed on stony places... This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. If we don't spend the time to study and develop the relationship with God again, some of the words can begin to stick, and then we just let it go. It can happen. Verse 22, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. This is perhaps one that we can get our teeth into a little bit as far as it applies to the people of God. This cat always seems to find a way out. 
anyway. But this particular one, as far as allowing the world's riches and money and physical possessions to distract us from the goal, the primary love that we are supposed to have and develop, it can cause us to become unfruitful. How many warnings do we read in the scriptures pertaining to the people of God where that applies? But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who hears the word and understands it. What did we read in Revelation? We need to read it. We need to understand it. We need to keep it. All of it. It's our responsibility. But it doesn't mean that all of us are going to read it. Or all of us are going to truly develop an understanding and a depth in it. Or that we're truly going to apply it and keep it. How many people have we known that have let it go? We don't know if they were called. We don't know the situation. But we've seen examples of friends, family members that have let it go. Ephesus had their physical surroundings and conditions in their day and their individual acceptance of it to overcome. Him who overcomes. There's a lot of things that Ephesus had to overcome. Christ is walking amongst all of his people. He knows all their strengths and all their weaknesses he understands the next step in their conversion. He understands what they need. The message that was brought was from God, was the truth for them to accept and to keep and to preserve. That is their responsibility. But over time, what appears to be a predominant number of those in Ephesus lost direction for their lives and grew to love something other than God and Christ first. Something else took precedence. Many of the circumstances that Ephesus faced daily are very similar to situations and circumstances we face daily. Is it possible that our reaction over time could also be similar to those called out ones mentioned in this letter? Have any of us left our first and primary love? Still working to keep the truth, still laboring, but perhaps for a wrong reason. Is it possible? Title of today's message is What is Our First Love? And this will be part one. I want to remember the first verses in the book of Revelation. John wrote about what Christ had accomplished and made possible for those that are called and that Christ was going to return to establish God's family and laws and governance here on earth. Along with that, we all have the responsibility to read, to hear, and to keep certainly the prophecy that's in that book, but all the truth that God has given us. All of this was given to remind them and encourage them of the hope that they have and the goal for which they fight. But those in this letter had over time left their first love. I'd like to go to Exodus chapter 32. I want to begin to think about how this can happen. Exodus chapter 32. We're going to begin reading here with verse 1. Again, very, very familiar section of Scripture. 
Verse 1 says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. Moses was up for quite some time, longer than the people expected. And that's the key. Much longer than they expected. The people did not understand what was taking place. If you go back to when they crossed the Red Sea, and you think of those waters coming together and the Egyptian army being wiped out, and Moses kneeling, and that song of Moses that was sung, and all the Israelites thankful for everything that God had made possible for them, in such a short time, they found themselves here. And it's all motivated by Moses taking longer than he they thought that he should have on the top of the mountain. Because of this, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us, for as, far, for, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The Israelites had been freed from captivity and given hope of a physical promised land, by what God made possible, by what God revealed to them. They had been given hope by giving freedom. They had been given a goal of the physical promised land. They left thankful for what God had done, but quickly found themselves doing this. What prompted this to progress was just the fact that Moses took longer to return to them than what they thought. Very quickly, they left the purpose and the hope that God had set in front of them and they turned back to what they had learned in the society that they had grown up in, what was around them. This condition here, in this particular instance, developed much quicker than the condition that we see in the first letter of Revelation. The only thing that I could put my finger on to say why it happened so much quicker here is that the Spirit of God was not in them here. The Spirit of God is in those in Ephesus. They have an individual relationship but the Spirit of God is not predominantly in all of the Israelites. How many examples could all of us come up with that is similar to what we have looked at thus far? There is a calling or an awareness made possible, and the goal and the hope is given by God through whatever apostle or prophet in Scripture only to eventually watch most people lose sight of the vision and turn to another goal or another God. Most all of the messages that we read from the major and minor prophets involve a message of the people to repent and to turn from the direction that they're going. So many times in Old Testament times, especially in the times of the kings, when a righteous king was in charge and obeyed God, the nation followed, obeyed, and were blessed.
But most of the cases involve an unrighteous king leading the nation into idolatry and sin, thus bringing on the warnings and the cursings, punishments from God. Today, we can look at history, both on what we know of mankind's history as well as the history spoken of in Scripture, and we see some of the same trends among God's people. We are given hope by Christ's sacrifice. We have the goal of Christ's return, the stature of the fullness of Christ being given to us as our goal. But the return is taking much longer than we ever expected. How many times have we had predictions made and we were ready to flee? But here we are, 40 plus years later, still trying to understand, still trying to hold on to what has been revealed to us, to carry what we've been given. It is the waiting for it to happen, and the wait is most always longer than we expect, that can present problems for God's people. It's persevering. It's using resourcefulness. It's having faith that what God has given us is enough. And we don't reach out for other ideas and other teachings because it's taking longer than we thought. Please go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Begin reading here with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he, Christ, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They still wanted it to happen right then. They thought this is what should happen. And all of them in their writings refer to Christ returning in our day. The return of Jesus Christ, verse 7, and he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. We are given the goal, but we are not given any kind of timing for when it will take place. We won't know. Hebrews chapter 2. This has been the condition for all of God's people from the time John wrote the book of Revelation, from the time of Jesus Christ all the way to our time. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore we, Paul is including himself in this scripture, therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Same thing we read in Ephesus. Ephesus drifted away from their first love. Even here in Hebrews, Paul is battling this. He's talking about this because he's witnessing some doing it. Drifting away from the purpose and the goal. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and, dis- transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? This word for neglect, this Greek word can be translated to be careless of, to make light of, to not regard. The hope of the salvation that all of us have been given by God. He has made this known to us. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, number one, 
was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Number two, and God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. God works amongst his people through his Spirit. God witnesses to his people by leading them and guiding them and helping them to understand, but at times also with warnings and correction that all of us need. This book was written somewhere, the book of Hebrews, in the 60s A.D. And we see even here, some 30 years before the letter to Ephesus was written, some of the same warnings. Drifting away from that first love was a warning because of the fact that it was happening amongst God's people. Paul emphasizes the judgment of God in such a situation for any who neglect the hope of the goal that we have all been given. Please go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin reading here with verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, having confidence to pray to God by what Jesus Christ made possible, the hope that we have, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. What did we read about in the parable of the sower? There's all kinds of conditions of our heart that can be such that may not even recognize what's being said. Our heart has to be right before God, of a contrite and a humble spirit before Him. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, no doubt, that what God promises will happen, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, every one of God's people needs to overcome who we are, what we have made of ourselves, what we have chosen in this life that we have to overcome. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful once again he's writing this because he's seeing some waver there is a need that he has to give this encouragement to god's people verse 24 and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works encourage one another to hold true to what we've been given to serve one another, to love one another, to help one another. This whole character that's supposed to change to become like Jesus Christ. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. He specifies this one that there are some people who feel they don't need to fellowship with others. And it's obvious we do it, it helps but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, long, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's a physical punishment. Verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose 
Will he be thought worthy who was trampled the Son of God underfoot? Again, taken so lightly what Christ has given to allow us hope. Take it so lightly that they would trample him underfoot. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 32. After giving, again, another warning. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle struggle with sufferings. What was one of the messages of the book of Ephesus? Remember from where you have fallen. Remember what God did through you, the hunger that you had for the truth, the hunger that you wanted for righteousness, to learn the truth. You endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Paul is looking back at all of the good things. You might say in the book of Ephesus, all of the good traits that were listed. And then God said, remember from where you have fallen. Remember what you felt, what your heart was like. And do the first works. You had compassion on me in my change and fully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, your faith, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, patient endurance. You need to grow in it. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. There's coming a time, even though it's taken much longer than any expected, that it's going to happen. Now the just shall live by faith. Everything they do will come from their faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Notice we see the same hope through the sacrifice of Christ, the same promise of Christ's return, and the same issue of trying to hold on as the return takes longer than anybody expected. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. This book is written somewhere in the 50s AD, before the book of Hebrews. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. It's it's a maintaining of this testimony of Jesus Christ in all of us that has to be continual. We cannot let down. Verse 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. And every single one of us can say that. This day should not overtake us as a thief. But as I read that, I ask myself, will it? Is it possible for me? You are all sons of light. Verse 5, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. 
We are not of the night nor of darkness. We have been called to see the truth. We can see it. We can understand it. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Spiritual sleepness. And there are many stages of that. There are some that are literally can be in a spiritual coma. There are some who can be drowsy. There are degrees of this that any of us could be in at any time in our life. And if you're like me, you could look back at your life and you could see times where spiritually I was drowsy and asleep. And it usually takes something major to wake me up. And I see it and I'm able to come back. God's mercy, His work. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let's be self-controlled with all that we're faced with. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath. He did not call us to experience the wrath of God. That was not the purpose. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The goal, once again, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. As the time takes much longer than we expected. Think back through your life. How many times has there been somebody come up to you and say a word that you needed to hear? Give you a hug that you needed? Perhaps told you you were doing something wrong that you needed. All of that as we come together as fellowship, but only as each of us remain connected to God, understanding what these words say and applying them correctly, can we give the encouragement, again, from God through us, that God makes possible. Again, we see the same hope, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the same promise of Christ's return, and the same issue of trying to hold on as the return again takes longer than expected. The same thing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had already come. Here is a false teaching that was prominent in their day that said Christ had already returned. It wasn't taking longer than expected. It already happened. And think about it. If somebody accepts that as a truth, they're no longer looking forward to it. They no longer have that goal. It's already done. Let no one deceive you by any means. Through this time that takes longer than expected, all of God's people are going to be made subject to this temptation. And all of us are going to have to stand up for the truth. Every single individual, not just a congregation, not relying on any minister, it's going to be you standing up for the truth. God is testing all of us as individuals to stand up for the truth. Please drop down to verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through the setting apart, the sanctification by the Spirit, and belief in the truth, the truth that God has given, not the truth that men can profess, but it's the truth from God that we hold on to. 
to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Same thing, same instruction. Could be different circumstances, different trials. But all of this is for God's people. Some had already started to lose heart in what God had revealed by turning to a doctrine that Christ had already returned. How many doctrines have we seen in our day where people have listened to it and believed it and given up the truth that they once known? How many times have all of us been tempted by that same thing and had to prove for ourselves what was God's truth and what was something else? All of us have had to stand up for the truth up to this point. But again, I remind you, the letter of Ephesus lists all of those good points. But what they were commanded, what they were told to look at is that they had left their first primary love. As we think through what we have addressed thus far, how much of all of this seems familiar to what we've experienced? All of us. We are excited by what God has made possible, but how much have we went through that we had to fight to hold on to the truth? That we had to take steps where we didn't know what was going to happen next, but we had faith in what God had promised, and God proved himself faithful to us. Just like Ephesus, we have to examine ourselves. What is our first love? For all of us, that may be different. I hope and pray that all of our first love is what it should be. But this message today focuses on the issues and problems that God's people have all faced that we read of so many examples in Scripture, and there are so many more. Take the time, if you want, and go through and look at all the instructions of the hope being held up, of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the goal of the return of Jesus Christ and what he brings with him, and the reactions of the people that follow. We are experiencing those same things. This message today begins to focus on some of those issues that we face. And again, an examination of ourselves as individuals as to the condition and the direction of what we love most. The message to Ephesus, yes, I believe that those letters represent seven areas of God's church. But the messages of each of those letters are for all of the churches. All of them. We need to heed the warnings that are there. Just like those who have come before us, it has taken much longer than any of us expected. I've stood up at the feast, I remember in years past, in leading songs and say, here we are in whatever year it was, how many of us thought we would still be here at the feast in that year when we thought Jesus Christ would have returned long before then? We are being tested by how much we love God and that we love Jesus Christ and we love his truth. We are being tested. How many spiritual speed bumps have we had along the way how many doubts have we had to overcome? How many sins in ourselves have we had to overcome to progress? Next time, we will continue with the lessons to be learned and applied from the letter of Ephesus as we think about what is our first love.
Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Brethren, we have one more opportunity on this day to sing praises to God, so if you all take your hymnals, stand with me. Turn with me over to page number 23 in the older hymnals, page number 49 in the newer hymnals. Following this, I'll give the closing prayer, then we will have some local announcements uh, to follow that. So, page number 23 in the old, 49 in the new, mine eyes upon the Lord continually are set. Please bow your head. Our great Father, eternal God, we come, we pause before, before your great throne now at the close of this service. We thank you for this message. We thank you for bringing us your word and the examples that we have that you've described for us. Father, please help us to take it, to learn from it, to apply it in our lives. Help us to be mindful of the areas where we may be falling asleep, that we may be drawing away from you. We know that you are true and faithful to always be there when we approach you, great God. And we know that there is a time that's coming, that it will be too late, that we need to make action now to ensure that we are truly centering with you. Father, we're so blessed to understand what we do. We're so blessed for, by your grace, by your patience with with our human frailties. And Father, we ask that you would continue to guide us and direct us. We know that there's many now that are sick, that need your healing, that need your comfort in challenging times. We ask that your will would be done in each and every one of their lives. And we're so blessed to understand that this physical life is not the end all to be all, that your great plan is being worked out. And Father, we're so grateful for these things and we ask this now humbly through the name of your great Son, our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ. 